What's up guys, that guy the pencil here, and welcome back to part two of how to fix the overhaul arc. A lot happened last time, I just recommend you watch the last part, because a lot of things have changed, like, drastically. So, go ahead, rewatch, figure it out, whole bunch of plot details happened last time, and we're just gonna hop right back into the plot right here. Allow me to uproot the entire invasion part of this arc. Seriously, the only thing we're keeping is the Mario V overhaul fight and the opener, except we're changing the opener too. The heroes arrive with the Warren, and like in the original story, Katsumake comes through and punches down the door, angry with the heroes for intervening so early in the morning. However, instead of Ryukyu just popping full dragon form to just sort of stall him, all the interns blitz and annihilate Katsumake. Midoriya and Mirio punch him dead in the face, Ejure, Asui, and Uraraka blast him, drop kick him, and launch a manhole cover into his torso respectively. Kirishima breaks his balance with a tackle, and Tamaki finishes the job by finally knocking him over with a tentacle attack. Everyone's ready, and moves on in and no one is slowed down or deterred. The cops that were sent flying are saved by the pros, and the interns waste no time in rushing in. The cops restrain Katsumake, and that's the end of him. Yes, he's just one hurdle in the path. He is not something that will take Ryukyu, Nejure, Ansui, and Uraraka to take down. Do I understand the Buddhism symbolism? Yes. Was it worth it? No. So, the heroes have rushed in. Nidai pulls his little trick with the vase, and they are once again approached by an entire army of Yakuza. However, now Nejure and Ryukyu are there and they are not in the mood to be wasting time. Senejure and Ryukyu instantly blast off with powerful shockwaves and a stream of fire. Nadai orders Centipede and Bubble Girl to cuff and restrain the Yakuza, and the heroes forge ahead. Tamaki is seen munching on a shiny object at this point. They are following the tracker best they can when they run into Mimic manipulating the room around them. Nejure offers to shatter the walls with Ryukyu, Kirishima, and Midori ready and willing to assist. However, Nadai explains that that could cause the area to collapse in on them, and they can't chance it. However, Mimic strikes and separates all the heroes. So I sacrifice an expendable. That seems a bit unfair in terms of overhaul side. They're outnumbered, but here's the setup. Asui and Uraraka vs Sakaki and Dabi. Ryukyu, Fat Gum, and Nidai vs a clone of Overhaul. Rappa and Tengai vs Midori and Kirishima. And Nejure, Tamaki, and Mirio vs Hojo, Setsuno, and Tabe. So I know some people are going to go wild at my placement of some characters. One of the biggest ones is definitely going to be the changing of Tengai and Rappa and their whole fight because a lot of people love that fight, myself included, but by subbing out Fat Gum from Midoriya, we turned the Spear and Shield versus Shield and Shield, at least initially, to directly Spear and Shield versus Spear and Shield. It's more interesting that way, trust me, when we get to it, you'll understand, at least from my perspective of it. We're gonna make it a true match here. While the Skinny Gum reveal was extremely epic, it's just getting moved, trust me. Also, this gives Midori something to do before everyone else gets something to do. For this fight, I want the two's lack of connection and practice synergy to come into play for both sides. While Tengai and Rappa were paired together because of their quirk synergy, Overhaul ignored their lack of personal synergy, as he doesn't see people. He sees quirks and tools. While Midoriya and Kirishima can have great quirk and personal synergy, the two never really interact. This fight is a bonding experience for the interns, and a match for the character reveals of the Expendables in the original. Midoriya is still not a proper fighter yet, but he learned one thing from Nidai how to dodge in close combat. Rappa swings and Midoriya is barely able to dodge. However, he gets reckless and punches into a wall because he attempts to throw a punch and Rappa takes the hole in his offense and punishes him for it. Rappa goes to capitalize only to be intercepted and blocked for a few moments by a rushing unbreakable Kirishima. Like in the original story, Kirishima gets annihilated in a few fast hits and sent flying into a wall. However, in those precious moments, a grinning full cowling Midoriya comes in to throw out the final blow only to get punched right into a barrier which Tengai made. Rappa is annoyed and punches through the barrier, sending a confused Midoriya flying. Midoriya recovers, but Kirishima is having an internal crisis. He broke, he wasn't able to help Midoriya, and both were about to die. Cue the Kirishima flashback. The entire thing. Don't change that. Meanwhile, Midoriya is occupying Rappa and trying not to die. Simple as that. And honestly, Midoriya has not learned his lesson yet. Midoriya is trying to land blow after blow and he keeps getting blocked and they're just outdone by a professional cage fighter like Rappa. However, Midoriya is learning. Midoriya needs to be a smart character to survive in this fight. He cannot just power his way through this one. He notices a flaw in Tengai's quirk by sliding on it rather than punching through it, dodging Rappa and throwing out Tengai. He notices once the barrier is set up, it does take Tengai a second to disengage it. So he lunges back in the battle and keeps going at Rappa, trying to look for an opening where he can trick Tengai into activating the shield and lunging in to capitalize. But Midoriya really just can't find it on his own. He's working extremely hard, but it's not just that that's going to do it for him in this fight. 
begins crying out to Kirishima, his hopes and dreams, what he wants to be, the number one hero, and how he wants Kirishima to fight alongside him to help with that. Kirishima is crying, but he's getting back up. He's understanding, he's relearning the same lesson he did in the original, that it's okay to break, but you can get back up and keep going. So, suddenly, when Midori is about to get punched one more time, Kirishima rushes in and blocks the blow, and Midoriya sees his chance. Just as Kirishima goes to swing on Rappa, and Tengai activates the shield, Midoriya bursts past both of them, getting inside the shield just as Tengai creates it, and sucker punching Tengai, knocking him out. Rappa is amazed, impressed, and excited. He's glad that the distraction is finally gone, but Kirishima swings on him again. He stops, but Rappa is then open to one good punch from Midoriya, which throws Rappa into another punch from Kirishima, which combos directly into a kick from Midoriya, and the two just go to town on Rappa, tearing him apart with their newfound bond and understanding of one another. Midoriya gets to show off his smarts, and Kirishima gets the development and background that was established in the original. Also, include the Rappa flashback once he's finally defeated to give him more character as a reward for the two combatants, since he's so proud of them for actually beating him, something he really didn't expect. Now, for the next controversial fight. Why is Dabi here? Because I wanted him to be here. He's already in the arc, and he works well for the fight against Asui. Also, I need him to save Expendables, honestly. Finally, I refuse to believe a character like Overhaul would let such a powerful person as Dabi sort of just exist freely like he does in the original narrative. Compress, I get, he needs his contact for his quirk to actually activate, but Dabi? The man that has blue fire that he can just release in towering plumes, he's too dangerous and too useful not to utilize. Those wondering if Dobby could fail the lie detector test given by Shin Nobuto, he actually probably wouldn't. The question was if they would betray Overhaul for Shigaraki. However, Dobby doesn't really care about Shigaraki, as he's a character with no loyalties outside of Stain, so he'd likely pass the test. Now, Asui and Uraraka, at the same time as the others, are thrown into a room filled with various debris. Instantly, the effect of Sakaki's quirk kicks in, and Dobby laughs at the two. He mocks them by stumbling and raising his hand, but suddenly Dobby is forced to dodge a piece of rock pitched as fast as a bullet. Then he's forced to flare up to avoid Asui from stomping his head in. Sakaki and Dobby are confused. The two should be stumbling around like drunks. How are they standing? Both Uraraka and Asui are grinning like mad women. Asui calls out to Sakaki, angrily remembering him as the man that prevented them from saving Eri, and both girls are ready for retaliation. Dobby is interested and readies himself for battle as Sakaki consumes even more alcohol. The effect increases, but like Mirio did in the base story, both heroines push through it. They drop the weights of their past and show the results of their training. Dobby turns up the heat, attempting to fry Asui directly, but Uraraka takes a particularly large piece of debris, an obstacle initially meant for whoever was under the effect of Sakaki's quirk, and throws it, giving Asui time to dodge. Dobby approaches with a flaming hand, and Asui and Uraraka tense. They understand that despite their sheer willpower pushing through the drunk's quirk, they were still being affected. Reaction times, their ability to stand and aim, all of that was in jeopardy with Sakaki there affecting them, and the walking death machine that is Dobby hunting them down. They decide that there's no other option but to try their team attack, as they both avoid Dobby's next boom of fire. Sakaki complains about the heat as he drinks more, but Uraraka is already tagging Asui. She lifts Asui up, reels back with Asui and Palm, the frog girl squats, and Asui springboards off Uraraka, slamming into Sakaki and incapacitating him. Uraraka and Asui are freed from the effects of his quirk, and they turn their full attention to an amused Dobby. He's impressed with the UA brats, and he can't wait to see what tricks they pull out next. Uraraka and Asui, while relieved that they are back to max, are unsure of their ability to actually defeat Dobby. All they know about him is that Todoroki relayed that his fire was stronger than his own. That blue fire was more dangerous than Todoroki's? That's it? They weren't confident that they could beat Todoroki together, not to talk with someone stronger. The two are forced on the defensive by a now unrestricted Dobby, who does not care about his partner as he fires all over the place. The two focus on what they know and what they can do, when mid-conversation an idea sparks for Uraraka when she sees a crack in the floor. As Dobby waits, itching at his scars, Asui nods to Uraraka. She stomps the ground and begins to jump all over the room, much to Dobby's confusion. Uraraka boldly proclaims that they've figured out exactly how to defeat Dobby, as she launches a piece of debris after piece of debris at Dobby, who avoids them all. Dobby, figuring that this is a bluff, ignores it and goes to roast Uraraka when she dodges. Dobby then switches his attention to Asui, who hasn't stopped her movement, cracking the floor more and more, and Dobby attempts to flamethrower chase her around the room, scorching the entire area. However, what Dobby doesn't realize is that Asui is moving him so he's no longer facing Uraraka, who has tagged a piece of cracked floor. Suddenly, Asui springs off the wall and lunges for Dobby feet first. Dobby laughs and goes for what he figures is an easy kill, until Uraraka launches a piece of broken floor directly in front of the charging Asui, blocking the flame pillar 
and Asui uses the continuous momentum of herself and the floating floor to block and slam Dabi into a wall, avoiding all damage herself. Asui points out, as Dabi calls blood from pain and damage, that Uraraka and Asui could never hope to beat Todoroki with the same strategy. The ice would just be too good of a shield. The fire, however, and that could be blocked by a thick enough slab of stone and outdone. Dabi hits the wall three times and vanishes, and the girls go out to cuff Sakuhi, ready to move on. Trio of friends versus trio of trash is up next, and to say the least, the big three are livid. They do not have time for this, and as Nedra is about to just blast them away, Tamaki holds her back. The three expendables are determined to win, and while I do like the original messaging they have about bonds, that kind of message sort of falls flat when Tamaki's bonds aren't there with him, fighting with him. This bonds versus one dynamic works much better in a fight that I will be remaking later. However, this fight is going to be a stomp. I want it to be. UA's strongest versus a few tough thugs. I want the message of this fight to be about the strength of the different types of bonds. The natural bonds born of friendship and camaraderie versus the bonds formed of convenience. I still wish to include the Tamaki flashback. This time, let it be a shared one. Nejire, Mirio, and Tamaki all reminiscing on their own bonds born of friendship. This will be more of a showcase fight, a warm up for the big three, and it flashes through big moments in all their lives. Mirio and Tamaki meeting, then meeting Nejire, and then the three becoming friends, then all training together, then laughing together after an intense sparring match, and back to them all working together to defeat the trash trio. I actually don't really have much specific choreography for this fight, I kind of just want this to be like a legitimate stomp. I, the only thing I must include is that I want to see the three show off their capable maxes in such a small area. It's revealed, also, that Tamaki was eating Steel Flakes in order to amp his attack potency and defense, and that the three have a team attack that involves Tamaki launching the other two at high speeds, and they use their teamwork to nullify and outdo the other trio. However, I want this fight to end with Mirio realizing that they are burning time and that they must catch up to Overhaul and Aerie. So, Tamaki and Nejire decide to help him out. Tamaki makes a platform with a clam and throws it up as Mirio squats on it in midair. Nejire fires a shockwave and Mirio is sent flying through the walls to catch up to the objective. Now, the three pros are forced into a room together. All they see is twice an overhaul standing there. The three pros instantly surmise the situation. This is not the real overhaul. But with one touch of the ground, they realize that this doesn't really matter. Night A barely dodged all the spires. Ryukyu in a similar situation and Fat Gum was hit, but his quirk allows him to take the damage. Night Eye realizes how dire the situation is as twice last, but like in the original, Night Eye ends up throwing a hyper mass seal that destroys twice his mass and causes twice to run. However, the Overhaul clone is still there and just moves the terrain again to kill them all. Nadai sees a spire rushing towards him at high speeds, and as he moves to dodge, he is nabbed and saved by Ryukyu, who has spawned her wings, armored her arms and legs, and has her tail out, and fire leaking from her mouth, and it cuts to show Fat Gum almost impaled by a melted earth spear. The clone wastes no time in going for another kill shot, and Ryukyu shatters the approaching spears, and Fat Gum curls up to take more damage. Nadai feels useless as he's simply being protected by the stronger heroine. Fat Gum falls and Ryukyu catches him, still unable to go all out. She has two people she must protect, and while the room is big, if she tried to go any further, if she even wanted to, she would actually end up causing more damage than what was needed at the time. Now, she orders Fat Gum to protect Night Eye, and rushes the overall clone, which touches the ground again. Fat Gum closes Night Eye in him, and Ryukyu studies the clone's actions and the area around her. A spear lunges up and Ryukyu shatters it, wanting to test something that she's noticed. Fat Gum is still getting pierced, but Night Eye is protected, making him furious. The area is torn asunder again, where Yukiu gets her answer. Disconnected pebbles and debris do not get changed with the rest of the room. She roars this out to the other two, and Night Eye, in a moment of clarity, gets an idea. He roars out, Scorched Earth! Ryukyu and Fat Gum both understand instantly. Ryukyu roars out a stream of flame, but Overhaul defends himself with rock. Fat Gum takes it, absorbing it all. As Fat Gum processes the power, Ryukyu reels back, ready to chance collapse. The overall clone strikes to kill, but a hyper mass seal is thrown, preventing Overhaul from touching the ground, just long enough for Fat Gum to drop him, and the two power base heroes slam the ground apart, splintering it beyond repair. By the time the clone touches the ground, all it has is a tiny platform that barely forms a spike, and Nida himself is thrown in, and he breaks the overhaul clone's neck. The only safe area, and the clone disappears. He kneels and looks to Fat Gum, who is still rather large. Ryukyu has reverted, supporting Fat Gum. Nida goes over to help the both of them, and they all stumble along. Rocklock and Aizawa. Yeah, they're against Togen twice again. Toga and Mimic are playing games on Aizawa and Rocklock, constantly shifting between invisibility and people shifting and room shifting, and Rocklock is impressed as he locks down different parts of the area and Toga's weapon, and Aizawa keeps shutting down Toga's quirk. Then, Twice pops up from the other pro heroes and then creates a Toga clone to assist. 
Rocklock goes to block an attack when suddenly his quirk is shut down. He doesn't know why, but he sees Aizawa looking at him. But the whole reason Aizawa even was looking at him was to disable Twice who's in the middle of making another clone, but he just happened to be in Aizawa's line of sight. That's why Rocklock got shut down and ended up taking a stab wound from Toga who was also revealed. The issue with this is that the moment that's done, Aizawa shuts down his quirk and the two manage to dismantle the other two villains, locking in seriously. As the two heroes begin to sync up better with one another, Toga and Twice realize that they cannot win and end up retreating. However, the damage has been taken and this will factor in. Now, Mirio has caught up and we get the entire Mirio v Overhaul fight except cut out Sakiki's part in it. I love everything about this fight, it's perfect, a bit short, but I'm personally not even sure how much to extend it except just show more of the fight, especially like after Mirio becomes quirkless, but this is where the true battle begins. Everyone arrives, and I'm talking everybody. Every last hero on the scene busts through a wall, not just Midoriya. However, Aizawa still does get struck by Chrono's quirk, and Midoriya knocks Chrono away. Overhaul looks around. Midoriya, Kirishima, Fatgum, Ryukyu, Asui, Uraraka, Rocklock, and especially Nighteye, Nejire, and Tamaki. Specifically, Tamaki instantly goes all out upon seeing Mirio, tearing into Overhaul and slapping him away. He is furious and filled with bloodlust, and the other heroes watch in a mix of abstract horror as the beating continues. Overhaul attempts to touch Tamaki, but Tamaki is moving far too quickly. He's lashing out full force, annihilating the area around him, except for where Mirio and Eri are standing. Ryukyu defends the others from the carnage, and Shin awakens. He witnesses his master getting defeated, and reaches into his pocket. He loads the gun with something, and then fires, and Overhaul's hit. Suddenly, the steel tentacle that was smacking Overhaul vaporizes, and everyone is confused. His hands didn't touch the object. Tamaki lives, but Overhaul lands headfirst into the ground. Spikes flare up everywhere, and Midoriya snags areas Fatgum, Ryukyu, Kirishima, and Tamaki protect everyone else. Overhaul has healed himself and steps. More spikes, but this time the very room collapses and everything goes dark. Preferably, this is where a chapter slash episode ends. We cut back and see everyone lifting rubble. Eri is cradled in Midoriya's arms, but everyone is still alive. Overhaul has gone dead silent and moves. The ground moves with him, and Mirio's eyes widen, but a burst of energy slams dead into Overhaul. Nejire stands there, focused and sparking with energy. Tamaki rises, throwing away rubble and gritting his teeth. He orders everyone else out. He and Nejire have this one. However, in spite of that, the three pros stay. Fakum tells Rocklock to make sure everyone else gets out safe. And everyone starts to retreat, and Eri is carried off by Midoriya. But Racerhead by Rocklock, and the fellow younger interns follow. Overhaul recovers, and the two men among the super beings watch as the fight begins. However, for the moment, we stay with Nighteye, who hugs Mirio closely and carefully begins to bandage him. Praising him, stating how he's so proud and how he knows despite what he cannot see, Mirio will be great no matter if he has a quirk or not, whether he himself is there or not. Mirio is confused and grabs Nighteye the best he can, but the man turns. Foresight has been activated on Mirio. Nighteye knows what's going to happen. Tamaki and Ryukyu take the lead, throwing projectiles and launching streams of flame. Kirishima is blocking all the debris from Midoriya and Eri, while Uraraka and Asui play constant support from afar, launching debris made weightless by Uraraka and launched at high speed by Asui's kicks. The newly enhanced overhaul is able to take it all, responding by blocking the fire and redirecting projectiles. He is walking forward, the ground shifting around him without his hands. Nare begins to yell out moves, attacks, things he's seen. He no longer fears the future. He accepts it, not trying to change it, completing a small arc. They begin listening and Overhaul is slowly being outdone. Then, as Nidai goes to call out another command, Namuto is thrown towards Overhaul. None of the heroes react in time to prevent the absorption. It's still the same appearance that he gets when he absorbs Namuto in the original story. However, Overhaul is still attempting to kill the heroes with various spikes, which Fatgum simply keeps absorbing and Ryukyu keeps destroying, and Tamaki and Nejire keep dodging. Mirio is confused why he nor Nidai have been attacked yet. Then, one of the arms calls out to Eri, like in the original. Eri is scared, but Midoriya holds her firm. She freaks out, but Midoriya gently cradles her, allowing her to cry. Midoriya realizes that he is too weak to help right now, but it, he can be a hero in a different way, by taking care of a young girl. Overhaul realizes that she isn't coming, and that she must be taken by sheer force. He stacks his transformation again, absorbing Katsumake into his disgusting body mass after his earlier attack destroyed the entire upper ground. 
However, the quirk amplifier is still flowing through his vein. The original effect that Katsumake has in the primary narrative kicks in. Everyone is slowly getting more tired and drained, and overall goes for the true kill. However, then Ryukyu decides that she's done holding back. No more being held down by the way of the past. As earthen pillars rise up to kill them all, we get a full two-page reveal of her true dragon form, and she protects everyone. She roars out, shaking the very earth around her as Night Eye gives her a look. She instantly understands, and she flies in overall, rushing through the pillars as if they were nothing as she runs low on stamina. Night Eye barks another order, and Tamaki and Nejirai ready themselves. Stamina absorption is focused on Ryu Kyu, who has the largest body mass, who cold heart tackles the mutated overhaul while covering herself in her own flame, destroying a majority of his torso as she forcefully reverts to a weaker state due to the stamina loss and touching overhaul, even though covered in flames. Just as overhaul turns to capitalize, we finally get it. Tamaki and Nejirai launch a fully energized Slim Gum, who lunges in with his max strength and forcefully buries his fist, which is shielded by a clamshell from Tamaki, through Overhaul's back. This sends Overhaul flying, disconnecting from his massive construct, but Fat Gum is nearly destroyed by the effort. He collapses from fatigue, but the job has been done. Overhaul is separated from his lackeys, alone, by choice. Only he can do this. Only he can do what's right. Fat Gum and Ryukyu have weakened him, but now both are in danger. Nadai stands before Mirio, protecting him still. There are only two fighters left, and Nadai tells him the truth. He tells the other members of the Big Three that this is it. They have to do this. No one else is coming. The other two will not rise. This is their last stand. Nadai and Tomiki lock eyes for a moment, but instantly approach. The fight is brutal, the trigger amp slowly fading from overhaul as he becomes more vulnerable, but only slowly. Tamaki's emotions rise to a fever pitch, launching himself full body at overhaul, detaching manifestations, throwing them about wildly, not caring about survival. His best friend, his son, is about to burn out because of this man. He will not allow it. Nejire is similarly furious. Her friend, her equivalent of a brother, will die if she fails, and slowly but surely, her blasts begin to straighten. Slowly, the blasts begin to get faster. Both are going wild, but Overhaul is approaching. Then, Nidai finally charges in the battle, ready to finally play out his part. This is what may change the future. Mario realizes what's going to happen and screams out for him to stop. Now that he's in Overhaul's sight range, the spears come up from behind Tamaki and Nejire and pierce him as he throws one final hypermass seal, and this throws Overhaul off balance as Nidai's chest is speared. All three members of the Big Three scream, and suddenly, Nejire and Tamaki go dead silent. Nejire blasts off. It is straight and dangerously fast, blasting over all the way. Tamaki wastes no time in launching off everything he can in one more Chimera Kraken. The two are awoken, but Overhaul roars back with one final rush. The battle is extremely violent, and Nejire and Tamaki are slowly tiring as Overhaul begins to overwhelm them. Ryo stumbles over to his dying teacher, who says he loves them as his own eyes go dark. Ryo screams out, and his friends hear that cry and get their last burst of energy, synchronizing their attacks against Overhaul, who's finally dying out and is overwhelmed by their combination, collapsing. Both Tamaki and Nejire, practically dead from overexertion, turn to a shocked, crying Mirio, who is holding Night Eye's dead body. The three students break down and start crying a river of tears, all circling around Night Eye's body. There is no ambiguity here. Night Eye is dead, with a smile on his face. So let's wrap this up really fast. Eri is still freaking out, but Midoriya wraps her up in the remains of Mirio's cape and takes her to the police officers. He then rushes back to the scene where he thinks it's over. He sees the sight of his elders crying around his teacher's body, and he breaks down too, remembering all the times Nadai helped them up in that moment. Uraraka and Asui come in to console him, and the battered heroes slowly rise up to take care of their shattered interns. A group comes together, and we get Overhaul getting robbed and disabled by the League. Everyone's in the hospital, and the Ark dies down. Kirishima? Midoriya, Tamaki, Mirio, Najire, Fatgum, Rocklock, and Ryukyu are all injured, but alive. Midoriya has his talk with Mirio, but he promises he's not going to forget what Night Eye taught him and who Night Eye was. And people are helping slash studying Ares' quirk, which in this version, they still don't fully understand as they've never seen any live action of it. So there we go, that's my arc rewritten. Time to explain! Okay, so the ending of this arc may have seemed like a wild, crazy, stupid mess, and honestly, kind of? Not really, because here's why. The big three were the center focus of this arc. It started with them, it should end with them. It makes little sense for Midori to just burst on the scene and handle it all himself. 
Midoriya handling the fight alone is also not ideologically or thematically satisfying either. Overhaul, even the original narrative, believed that he had to stand alone. At the peak, he had to do it himself and himself alone. Everyone else was a pawn. He literally compared people to pieces in a game of shogi, the man's heartless. So, it would make thematic sense that he would be beaten by the bonds of people. For those about to claim that Midoriya did beat him with the power of bonds, no, he didn't. He did exactly what Overhaul did, and used Aerie to his advantage once it was situational, and then just stopped really caring about her once she served her purpose. It's hypocritical, yes, but one five second festival bonding isn't much. It's just bad. Like, I know it would be difficult to have Midoriya take care of Aerie or do anything of the sort, but it's still, it's just a mess, honestly, at least in my mind. And also, I've gone over this before, it breaks the rules previously established about One For All and Rewind. For One For All, Midori's body breaks down when he hits something, not just activating the power, just lighting up with 100% should not be destroying his body, and it just doesn't. So, Aerie should have wiped him from existence. Aerie's father touched her, and he was rewound out of existence. And as everyone states, Aerie's quirk has only gotten stronger with time, not weaker. So Midori shouldn't exist in that original fight. It was not good, it was pretty dumb, it was hypocritical, and no. Back to character growth, everyone's arcs that were set up were completed in this version. Tamaki overcame his stage fright, giving orders and leading the battle. Nejiri gained focus and power, being able to straighten her waves of energy and protect those she cared about, which she couldn't do in the beginning. Mirio has the same arc from the original, becoming someone afraid of taking action to taking the ultimate action to save one person. Adai even has an arc, going from being afraid of the future and wanting to change it, to being willing to accept the fate and work with it for the greater good. Fat Gum has the same arc switching from an all-tentative and defensive approach to approaching the offensive powerhouse he truly is. Even Ryukyu has an arc, one that had to literally construct from nothing, the nothing that was Ryukyu's character, but I managed to do it. She was weighed down by her past, having lost the things she had to protect already, which is why she never fully transformed, while with new things to protect, she breaks her shell and reveals her true might as a full dragon. Doya realizes that power is not everything, as he sees through Overhaul's failure, and Mirio's success as nothing more than a base human and his protection of Eri in the end. Kirishima realized that it's okay to break as long as you can put yourself back together like in the original. Asui and Uraraka both realize that just because you fail once does not mean that you cannot grow stronger just to try and try to make up for it again in the future. Even Rocklock realizes that the young are strong for the future, just like the original, as I realizes that he must be more careful with his quirk and always be more aware. But the biggest underlying idea of this arc Friendship and bonds versus solidarity, the true meaning of a hero, respecting all you interact with, all that I tried to keep in advance. Hope it did have a decent job. Oh, another quick justification for you wondering why I included Trigger in the end and gave that to Overhaul instead of using the Quirkless Gun again. The reason I did that is because Trigger was introduced at the very beginning of the arc, that was another element that was just thrown out there and then never really touched upon again. In fact, I don't think it's I don't think it has been touched upon again in the main My Hero Academia narrative since then, so I decided another nice way to bring it all the way around, use trigger for overhaul to give a better fight in the end. Honestly, I hope that I made this thing work. I tried to keep everything that worked and enhance it. I hope I did a have decent job. This arc was the longest in my hero already, so you may think all this character stuff may make it take even longer, and it would. And also, as a person who complains that nothing happens in My Hero, you may think that this arc being longer would bother me. However, I'm gonna have to disagree with that, because what this version of the arc does is grab you by the throat and not let go till the end. It opens up with a big three fight, goes through the introduction, gets to the point, fight after fight after fight after fight, and ends with a coming epilogue. Boku no Hero is fantastic when it's slapping you with back-to-back -back plot and action, so this would work really, really well in my opinion. Also, with this story just being smack after smack after smack, by doing that, it prevents plot contrivances. It establishes rules and characters while keeping them stable, something that the original arc fails to do. Overhaul in this version is always going for the kill. He just can't kill the people he's fighting due to their similar skill and power since Nejire and Tamaki, two characters with hype and showings, rather than Midoriya, are fighting him. Adai is equal parts serious and heartfelt throughout. The big three earn their titles in this version, showing how they are truly drastically superior to most heroes, with the actual pros falling back on their students. Midoriya actually has an internship. Not saving the day, but watching others do it. Kirishima gets the same development of never backing down. Uraka and Asui not only have something to do, but develop physically as well as psychologically, developing willpower and resistance, and learning that they can learn from their mistakes. However, who knows? Maybe I just made the arc way worse and missed the point. <laughs> so, tell me what you guys think. Whatever arcs you would like me to rewrite with similar stipulations to this one. This one was fun to write, considering it was like a miniature what if, so I'd love to do more. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is That Guy with a Pencil, writing off.